such a nice smiling group. <laughs> you're pretty much outnumbered, Chief. So. <laughs> as long as you're smiling with them, that's fine. So welcome to our, I guess I would say our fall September 14th meeting of our Health and Human Service. I come driving up here, some of the trees that are completely red and yellow and corn or our bean fields are ready for combining. It's uh, pretty awesome. If anybody knows where the summer went, just let me know. <laughs> It'll be back next week. For about yeah. 48 hours. Uh, I just want to come. So uh, we'll kick things off uh, a few minutes after 10. First order of business will be number two approval of the agenda as brief. Chair, I'm wondering if we could take 13, the kinship proposal, and move it up just so they don't have to do this again. I think that would be excellent. I don't know where you want to move it to. Uh, uh, we will have that uh, right after public comment. Okay. Or right after um, number six. Yeah. Information. yeah. Okay. Number six. So you guys are new. Standard. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies, it'll probably be different because I know you're all busy. And we're going to strike number. Which one, Tanya? Number nine. We'll table until next month. Chad's tied up this morning with, uh, with some things. We will have that. As far as we know, our golden age is on schedule, Tanya. Yes, Dana's on the call. Oh, I am good. here. I do have um, a visit from the state infection preventionist coming this morning at 1045. So I guess depending on how it goes, I'll try to. You want to do that right now with your schedule? We could allow that. It doesn't matter. I can be brief too, but yeah, just whenever if works. If you're prepared, uh, but did I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll make one. Okay. Unless you move her, you've got to get her. You're going to move her up? Yes, sir. Okay. We'll put that in where you're going to move her, and then we can approve the agenda. Uh, we'll, uh, right before the kitchen. We well, have a motion and a second, Madam Clerk. We're doing golden age, kinship, and then the COVID report? Correct. Okay. Correct. Got it. Thank All you. All in favor of that? Aye. 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 Moving on, approval of the minutes of our August 10th meeting. <laughs> Any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. aye. Uh, just number four, disclosure. I don't think we have anything there. Uh, Six, I don't think we have their public comments. Uh, Madam Clerk, anybody for in the public? No public comments. No public comments. Okay. Moving on to uh, the boss lady at Golden Age. Are you ready? Right. Are we at it? Yes. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. All right. So I'll just go over a few things um, kind of down my list here on our regular bullet points. Um, so as far as census goes, we're kind of static right now. We're not taking that many new ad new um, admissions due to our staffing um, and everything that goes with that. Um, as far as staffing goes, we're, we're looking for nurses, we're looking for CNAs. It's been a struggle. Um, as I think everybody knows in every industry, but we, you know, can't sh close our doors one day a week to give our staff a break. So it's been, it's really been a struggle. Um, we keep trying to recruit new staff, new nurses, new CNAs. Um, but of course the opportunities are kind of endless out there right now for those folks. Um, and with that, um, the vaccine mandate, we're working through the details of that right now. And what that means for us and communication of that, um, which is going to be another um, tough thing with our already um, short staffing situation. So 
all those things considered, we're being really selective on our admissions, but we're we're getting referrals from, I mean, it's it's crazy. They're coming from North Dakota and South Dakota, you know, people are just really, really stretching and really reaching because, you know, we're not the only facility that's not taking, you know, as many people as we normally would. So um, we do have about 96% of our residents that are vaccinated. Um, we're currently working with our medical director on those third doses, um, third doses, boosters, whatever you want to call them. Um, none of our residents currently qualify under the current um, recommendations for that. So we're waiting, waiting on that, thinking maybe those recommendations are going to change a little bit here in the future, but we're ready to give some of those third doses once we get the go ahead um, from the pharmacy. Um, as far as COVID goes, we're currently testing our unvaccinated staff twice a week. Our vaccinated staff get tested once a week. Um, that testing strategy has changed within the last week, but um, it will still leave us in the bracket for testing twice a week at this time. Um, like I mentioned earlier, our state infection preventionist is visiting us this morning, so that will be nice to um, She's been a resource for us in the health department as far as all of our regulations and rules are um, concerned. So questions or anything else you wanna know? That's just kind of a, a <coughs> brief overview. So how many residents do we actually have in our facility now? We have about 70 right now. We have that's a capacity of what? Our actual licensed beds are 109. And our with our current staffing, that seventy to seventy five is kind of where we're most comfortable right now. And Dana, how short are you? How many staff are you down? Um, well, we're down um, two full time nurses for the floor, and we're down s several CNAs. Right now, I have a couple traveling CNAs here that are filling in some of those holes on our PM shift, but. Um, yeah, we, and we haven't seen new applications for a long, really for a long time. Um, so it's been, yeah, been a struggle. The, the two nurses, is that two nurses in the three shifts or it's not two on one floor, is it? Right, it's it's one on, on one on PM shift and one on night shift. And then I do have an opening for a charge nurse on my day shift that we're, we'll probably fill internally, but then it will leave a hole somewhere else. So, yeah. I know you used to just always, there was a pool available. Is that pretty much gone too? Yeah, it is. We, we have a traveling nurse, an external pool nurse, a traveling nurse here. He's been with us through the summer. He's been great. Um, he leaves this Friday. Um, so we're really going to miss him because he's been filling in a lot of those holes. Um, and reaching out to those traveling agencies, we have several contracts and there's just nobody out there. and. And the problem is the folks that are out there are able to kind of set their price. Like, well, I'm not going unless you pay me X amount, which is well, well and above over what we're paying, you know, that they can get paid in some of these hospitals or um, other private facilities. Um, and then we have some local pool agencies that haven't, they haven't had any staff for us for a long time. And we even have a little, a small pool of our own casual nurses, but most of them have jobs elsewhere and are completely tapped out with that as well. Do we, uh, do we have a number of high school or that age that are in training? We do. We have an awesome group of high schoolers. Um, the problem is when you're under 18, you can't operate a mechanical lift in, in a nursing home. Um, so that's a problem because a, a large amount of our residents need those mechanical lifts for, you know, getting into bed, getting into their chairs, things like that. Um, and that's an OSHA rule that's been there forever. You know, they can drive their car to work, but they can't operate the buttons to put someone in their bed or chair. Um, so we have to be careful with how many high schoolers we hire and having to make sure we have someone over 18 on each, you know, wing to do those lifts. And um, we do have some really great high school kids right now that are, that we couldn't do it without them. Quite an area or just locally from Amory area? Um, we have Amory, we have Clear Lake, um, Ossie, we have one from Osceola, um, one from New Richmond. So we have quite a, quite a broad 
um, range we pull from there. And I just, I, I happened to interview a gal in Oshawa. She actually competed and drove a tractor in the in tractor pull Saturday. No, she was working in a nursing home lately. Christian home, and it was really interesting. She told me she's working at uh, the St. Croix County home now. Okay. Versus training. So if they are enrolled in a training program, are they allowed to do certain category of jobs? Yeah. Um, so the training program right now is a 75 hour course and of that is 16 hours um, clinical. So we've been working with the St. Croix Health Center. We just had three high school girls go through their course. Um, and most of it's done online, um, like the book work and stuff. And then they go there for clinicals and testing. Um, so it's kind of a nice. That's 1, you know, plus of COVID um, training opportunities. So it's easier for those high school kids, especially now that school's back in session to, um, to take those classes because they can do most of the work online after school or on the weekends. Yeah, that 75 hour training program. That was the key to what I was really looking mm -hmm. for. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for our young boss lady? <laughs> Really? Thank you, Thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Well, I remember years and years ago when this county put in over a half a million dollars a year supporting our Golden Age Manor, and we haven't done that ever since you've been there. So <laughs> thank uh, you. We uh you have the county, you're just doing an awesome job. Thank you. Rita might be trying to. Is she is Rita trying to talk to us? I think her see her picture up there. And of course, she's waving. I think there's someone sitting next to her, so I wonder if she's talking to them. Are you on board up there, Rita? Yes, I am talking, speaking with you today from Venice, Italy. Oh, oh. <laughs> you can make a phone conversation from Venice, Italy. <laughs> Yes, I'm speaking. <laughs> I, I'm in Venice at St. Mark's Square, San Marco Square in Venice, and it is 5 p.m. and I am joining the meeting. I'm sorry I was a few minutes late. Well, we're just so happy and grateful for you that you, uh, you can be an, our ambassador. <laughs> it's wonderful. And one for me. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks for the update. <laughs> Thank you. So we've got everything from Golden Age Manor. So, Madam uh, Boss Lady, Tanya, do you want to take over and introduce your folks? Sure. So, Supervisor Middleton had requested that Kinship of Polk County um, provide a presentation to this committee on the services that they provide. So, we've got <laughs> Way to the left. Why don't you start in the um, end there and introduce yourself with the young lady by the door. <laughs> I'm Amy Danielson. I am a service coordinator with Kinship and have been there for um, a little over 20 years. Why don't you tell us where you're all from so we know about how big a radius our, uh, our yeah. folks are traveling? Yeah, I'm from Amory, Wisconsin, um, and I serve the Amory, Clear Lake, and Clayton areas. We knew your name was Danielson. You had a people. <laughs> I'm not related to that, Jensen, although I like to pretend the stage was named after me. <laughs> Diana Anderson, and I'm one of the mentors. Um, Presser. Where? Presser, Osceola area. Oh. I'm having a hard time hearing you guys on, so I guess if we're going to be yeah, talking, maybe you need to be up at the podium. Yeah. Sorry. Because right. the mic is better up there. You still want us to introduce? Yep. Yep. So I'm Carolee Tollickson. Uh, <laughs> I'll come up really quick. Um, I have been with Kinship since 2000 for 21 years and serve the St. Croix Falls Osceola area. So, okay. I'm Sarah Jensen. I serve the Frederick Bluff community area that I live in St. Croix Falls. So, um, first and foremost, we just want to thank you guys all for taking the time and allowing us to share about our program this morning. It's our pleasure. Good. Well, thank you. 
Um, our director, Lisa Danik, was um, quarantined last minute yesterday, so we are doing our best here to fill in um, and share her piece. So um, we already went over the introductions here for everybody, for everybody that we have. Um, a little bit of our history. Um, Kinship of Polk County is a nonprofit youth mentoring organization that provides one-to-one -one mentoring for children throughout Polk County. Rich Camerud, a former human services director, established Kinship in 1980 with a group of concerned citizens of the county. Uh, we are an affiliate of Kinship Inc. Um, currently, the Kinship Affiliate Network is made up of 21 affiliates. Um, we are the largest in the state of Wisconsin and the second largest in the Midwest. Uh, Kinship is led by an active group of um, board of directors that includes seven volunteer members. We have three part-time service coordinators, a part-time executive director, and a fundraising committee along with more than 350 wonderful volunteers. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Kara Lee, who's going to share a bit of our program with you. All right, I'm just gonna walk you through the two programs that we provide in the county to our youth. Uh, the first program is our community-based program. That is what our uh, kinship was founded on in 1980 when we first started. We match youth between the ages of five and 15 with a caring adult. And when we get an application from a young person, uh, we do an in-home interview as a way to get to know their interests, their hobbies, uh, their struggles and challenges, along with just what's going well with them. Uh, we get a chance to talk with a parent and guardian as well, so kind of get a sense of what their hopes and goals are for a mentoring relationship. In turn, when we get an application for mentors, uh, we do a three references, state and local background check uh, to sex registry, and then an in-home interview with them as well as a way to get to know them, get to know their lifestyle, what they actively do so we can make good, solid matches. Uh, we base the matches on proximity. We like our mentors and mentees to live in the same community because it makes it much easier for them to get together and share life together. And then we also are very careful in matching so that they naturally have an interest or a hobby or something that they would enjoy doing together as they get to know each other. Those matches spend uh, three to four times a month together for a minimum of one year. And we don't hide the fact our hope is that we have done our job well. And at that one year mark, both sides would like to continue. Our community-based matches last an average of 3.8 years. So that we, we're just always wanting, as long as we can keep those matches together, many of them become lifelong um, friends and kind of more like family. Kinship loses its need or they lose their need of us. Um, in our school-based program, we started that in 1998 as a way to uh, support more youth in our community. And um, typically with that program, we use high school mentors who fill out an application and three references. We sit down with them as well for an interview to get to know them and to walk through our program expectations, what we're looking for. In turn, we rely on the counselors and the teaching staff to identify students in their buildings that need that extra support. And when we do those matches, they spend 30 minutes once a week together for the duration of the school year. Typically, um, in those, uh, during that time, they're playing games, they are doing crafts together, they're throwing a ball around, they're just doing things to build a relationship so that young people have an older friend that they can rely on and get support from. Um, so that's kind of the basics of our program. Uh, they're simultaneously running at any given time, and between the two, we serve uh, over 300 youth in our county. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back so Sarah can share more of Lisa's. Can you stay there a minute and just open to. for questions? Absolutely. Um, how many full time people do you have? Lisa, they, none of us are full time actually. Lisa is our yeah. director and she works typically 35 hours a week. And then I am um, between all the coordinators, we're all part time, ranging from 24 hours to 32 hours a week. Cool. Are a lot of those hours, do you have enough volunteer people or? We are always looking for volunteers. So there's always a need for mentors in our community. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, so there's always a need. There's always a waiting list of youth who are waiting for a mentor. Um, constant revolving door of looking for people who are coming on board and volunteering with us. 
we have a phenomenal group of mentors. So that's the benefit. Um, our high schoolers prove to be phenomenal. They are, um, it's fun because their experience in our school base often propels them to mentor beyond school. And so they'll often do it during their college years and it cycles. So it's been, for me, it's been a pleasure to be with Kinship so long because I've watched the longevity of um, what, you know, people who we've mentored become mentors in high school and prove to be some of our best. Uh, so, but yes, always a need for mentors. We're always looking. Personally, I've been around this 20 years. And I've just been always completely amazed at the kinship program and what they do for our county. And thank you, Amy, for bringing these, these people to our agenda to be with us this morning. Do you know of, are you on the agenda at our September board meeting? County board meeting, we are. We are, and we have a little bit more for you today. I don't want to take too much time. You can take as much time as you want because this is the number one program. And you're dealing with kids. I mean, the world is about kids at this point. Yeah. Well, I personally, I love working for the program, so it's been an honor to be on staff. Sarah's going to come back up and share more from, like I said, Lisa has been unable to be with us, but she'll share a little bit more of um, the background, and then we will share from the heart. Diana's going to share from the mentor's perspective. So. A little bit on who we serve. Uh, the children served by Kinship of Polk County are defined as athletes. These are kids who might be struggling with social or emotional adjustment difficulties, abuse, trauma, depression, anxiety, other mental health barriers, behavior problems, lack of support, and guidance. They often come from single parent homes with environments that might include poverty, low level of parental education, large number of adolescents, welfare dependence, family dysfunction, parental mental illness, or substance abuse and family discord or illness. The common community risks for these children include drug and alcohol abuse, struggles with mental health, suicide, depression, poverty, crime, and teen pregnancy. Many of our kinship families are experiencing multiple stressors, putting children at an increased risk for harmful behaviors and choices as they grow into young adults. Impact is huge an average of 373 mentoring relationships each year. In 2020, throughout the challenges of COVID, we still served 306 people. Our mentors were fantastic and flexing between in-person, pen pal, and virtual communication. We provide our mentors with formal training each year, focusing on mental health, cases, trauma, and toxic stress. This past spring, we partnered with Family Therapy Associates to present on the adolescent brain development, mental health and resiliency. We serve all eight school districts and we're able to keep school mentoring relationships going through the constant stage changes in school instruction models last year. We organize several events for our kinship community each year. Activities include snow tubing, St. Paul Saints game, fishing, craft nights, ice fishing, trail hog and burial course adventures, cooking classes, and volunteer opportunities like Feed My Starving Children. I'm sure you're familiar with ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, abuse, neglect, and household dysfunction. ACEs have been a focus on of our county for several years. Protective factors can help the child feel safe more quickly after experiencing the toxic stress of ACEs and help to neutralize the physical changes that naturally occur after a trauma. Protective factors help explain how some people who have sustained a great deal of adversity as a child have done relatively well in adulthood. One of the most impactful protective factors is a close relationship with the caring adult. This defines the role of a kinship mentor. They help our youth cultivate a sense of purpose, build problem solving skills, and show children what a healthy relationship looks and feels like. They support and nurture emotional and healthy development by being a stable and caring presence. They encourage healthy lifestyle choices and introduce youth to new experiences. So, we provide over 300 youth with critical protective factor each year. Think about how many of those youth we are guiding down a healthy path and keeping out of the system. We are a resource to the county whose initiatives include trauma-informed care, elements of plan to reduce mental health, substance abuse, and increased nutrition and physical activity. Our formal mentor training parallels the goals in the community. Our activities to get youth moving, 
importance of volunteering and building a sense of community all are assist in the county's goals and objectives that we just mentioned. This is reason to continue funding our work. As you take a look at the handout, you'll see a chart that highlights county funding over the years. As county funding has decreased, our funding costs have increased. In 2000, we were able to so focus almost solely on program services with little expense to fundraising. Fast forward to 2020, and 21% of our time was spent fundraising. Just think of what we could accomplish if we could focus less on advocating for funding and use more of our resources to deliver services. Secure and consistent funding from our county would help us to do this. At this point, I will turn it back over to Liz. Now it becomes the fun part, the heart of the program. Um, as you heard, Payment Diana Anderson is here from the dresser area. She was a mentor for us. Her mentee, Caitlin, and Caitlin's mom, Charlene, were unable to join us. But both of them wrote up just what kinship has meant to them. So on the back page of your brochure, you'll see Caitlin's write up, um, what she wanted to share. I'm going to actually read what Charlene wrote because I just think it's powerful to understand the, the actual, you can hear all the statistics, but what we, um, what we actually do comes from this. And so I'm gonna read her part and then introduce Diana and let her share uh, what kinship has meant to her. So to whom it may concern, at a time when our communities have ever increasing needs and dwindling resources, it can be difficult to decide which programs to trim and which ones to, get to continue funding. My hope is to show you unequivocally that the kinship program is both worth preserving and nurturing at all costs. As the parent of a teenage daughter went from withering to thriving in one short year, I cannot say enough about the clear need and the incredible benefits of the kinship program. When I contacted kinship two years ago, our family seemed to be drowning in hardship, and my two kids, especially Caitlin, were getting lost in the crisis. My husband is a military veteran who's had ongoing health struggles since his deployment in Bosnia in 1991. Caitlin herself has battled a chronic illness for the past six years, and in 2018, I experienced a frightening neurological episode and learned I had two small tumors on my brain. That same year, my husband also broke his back in a four-wheeler accident, and a year later, he was on the operating table for his second triple bypass. As my two kids tried to cope with these scary life or death struggles that kept rocking our world, I found myself gripped by incredible guilt and sadness. I knew I could not give my kids everything they needed. I could barely even take care of myself during that season. All too often, my children were the ones comforting and caring for me and their dad. As I watched Caitlin, especially starting to drown in the heaviness of it all. And so in the fall of 2019, I reached out to Carolee at Kinship. I was desperate to find someone to come alongside of my daughter and give her what I couldn't at that time. And Carolee brought a miracle into my daughter's life and into mine. She brought us Diana. There are no words to describe the relationship that is drawn between Diana and Caitlin. From the first awkward meeting in my living room to the crazy adventures they now share every week, it has been a blessing beyond words to have this woman in our lives. Somewhere along the way, Caitlin and Diana became so much more than mentor and mentee. They became friends. They became family. They became each other's cheerleader and biggest fan. They challenged one another to stretch and grow out of their respective comfort zones. They share common interests and a common faith. They bring out the best in one another. Diana was one steady fixture in Caitlin's life when everything else seemed to be shaking and crumbling. In the last two years, Diana has supported and encouraged Caitlin through huge milestones as Caitlin finished her first year of high school, started her first job, got her driver's permit, and even started her own small business. They've laughed together, cried together, served others together, and made memories together. Caitlin didn't just find a mentor in Diana. She gained a bonus grandma and grandpa and bonus cousins who mean the world to me. And I gained something in the deal too. In Diana, I gained a new friend, a confidant, a person with whom I can be real and share honestly about life struggles and joys. Diana and her family have generously opened their arms, their homes, and their hearts to Caitlin and to me, and it has changed our lives. This kinship program changes lives. I'm under no illusion that our family somehow has it harder than anyone else. To the contrary, there are lots of families and lots of children in our communities. 
who just like my daughter, desperately need a helping hand, a caring adult, and a sacrifice of love, time, and energy that will make life hopeful and enjoyable again. And kinship is the bridge that connects these caring adults with those hurting children who need that extra love and support. Again, I say to you emphatically, the kinship program changes lives. And I know that because it changed ours in ways that still astound me today. Maintaining or restoring the funding for this amazing program must be a priority for this county, for it will forever impact so many lives just like Caitlin's. I implore you to continue to ensure that every young person in this community who needs support and an extra dose of love can receive their own miracle to be connected with a life-changing mentor just like Diana. Sincerely, Charlene Prinson, Parenting Kinship Team. I'm going to turn it over to Diana. Welcome, Diana Anderson. It's hard. Um, I knew about kinship. Actually, two of the girls that worked there, and they had contacted me, fairly contacted me, and said, I have a match for you. Um, there's a lot of things in common. And um, I read through it, and one, the military thing was just one of the reasons that I for our military. So, because of their work, this match, if it had gone no further, we were enjoying our, our Tuesday afternoons. I picked her up at noon on Tuesday because she's home. We spent the time together. When I first she was not in agreement to do this. She was willing to do it for her mom. But maybe in the minute she knew that she was doing and not wanting to go, um, or rechecking her bag and being very, very nervous about leaving. But our activities, because we've been matched well, started started this. And um, we had some fun things. We both like animals. She had a um, a little garage kitty show up that she wanted to help. And we one of one of the things we ended up doing as once we built some shelters for him as they were working and getting him vetted and tamed and into the house. Um, we were driving along one day and I had seen a um, kitty climber thing tower at the edge of the road. I've since found it's called curb mining. Um, and Caitlin and I on a Tuesday afternoon stopped and loaded it into the back and she said, are you sure we're okay? We're not gonna, I, they would have left a collar in jail, but I knew the gal and text her and she said, love that you have it. So, done a lot of crazy things like that. Um, we do a lot. We have a cricket, a vinyl cutter. We make um, a lot of projects. Um, we do resin and make things. We like to do give to the community after um, all the rioting, the things at the local food source. We <laughs> stepped out of our comfort zone, made up some little care packages, both her and her mom and I, um, and went out and delivered them to some things to uh, men and women in blue. Um, we made, she volunteers um, at Tony so we made blankets and toys and stuff and donated for them. Uh, after the first spring of shutdown, um, and we knew, you know, people were with COVID were kind of isolated. We got a bunch of cheap clay pots, decorated them, put some dirt in them, and a pack of seeds and a little figurine with a message of hope. And we just dropped them where we felt led to leave them, just to bring a little bit of encouragement. She makes me want to be a better person. Um, so yeah, we were just going. And then towards the end, next year, spring in her step. And then instead of worrying about what we were going to talk about for an hour, an hour and a half, some days we go as late as six o'clock. Um, she would be worried, okay, if it's a bad road, she goes, I don't like driving in winter. I've got my dad coming to get us if the roads are bad. So we just wanted to make sure that it kept happening. Um, she met my grandkids. She's going to be 16. My grandkids are going to be 13, 12. And they, she started mentoring them. She started planning activities with them. And so here's this child that didn't want to leave. And now she's working with my kids, helping my grandkids. So everyone needs a little boost, a little kick, a little benefit to it. And she would help them with questions and decisions. Yet they also helped her have fun and be silly because she had been at home so long, afraid of with her health issue. She didn't want to go out and pass out, or she does pass out and has the most sleep. This is the girl that we did martial arts and soccer who went to staying at home fear of having issue. And so you see the girls doing plays or listening very, very loudly to the greatest showman soundtrack over and over and over again as they would review and play different songs on it and just having a good time. And I realized this is more than this is more than a match. This is she is a bonus granddaughter, cousin to my grandkids. We um, all enjoy great 
spending a um, wonderful time together. We, we keep searching for things. Now we're into houseplants this year that we are enjoying that. We buy dirt and make our potting soil and just for those kind of things. We always want to give to the community. Um, but it's just, she's totally changed my life. Totally changed my whole family's life. Um, there forever will be a Caitlin Lane, forever. Um, her ornament with her name goes on my tree with my name. We're just in the, this is just in the two years. Um, but I thank you for letting me share. I thank you for them always. And I thank you for uh, your interest in, in helping this continue to happen. This is, this is huge. I'll always have Caitlin, but there's plenty of other kids out there that really could use some help. You know, I raised mine. My husband's the over-the-road truck driver, and the people that came in and supported that helped me. And I just I know that you guys can help continue to help pitch a program. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you so very, very much. We we need to hear these stories. One thing about this committee is the difference between I think this committee and the county board meetings. I look at you people as like a family. I mean, everybody's got some struggles in life. And these kind of stories, they I think they hit everybody on heart. I think this is what we need in county government. Everybody is out there looking for us to help them to listen in some kind of way or that. So many times, you know, last year, we took probably what Joe, maybe almost an hour listening to people on our kinship program. Boy, some of the board members. We got to get on with the business. Yeah, we're there for a business and a person, but to hear these kind of stories that end up changing people's lives, we just don't hear enough. There's a lot of times I go home from a county board meeting but so much business and so much that we just eliminated where we could have helped people and made a difference in some of the things we did or didn't do. Hopefully that's what I want to see in this committee. How do you people here listen and we can hear stories like this all day. Appreciate it. the kids when they turn 15 that's a tender age but what, what happens then yes i um we actually carry so we try to we're initiating the match or starting the match we try to get them before they are over the age of 15 so we can carry them through 18. so, so the so kids don't get cut off no no so all of our matches we carry through the age of 18 or graduation and in many you know i Looking at a few faces in here that have been involved in our program, in many cases, they are already incorporated, like Diane, they're just family. So it's an end of a formal match at 18, but we do carry through 18. And then that, that, that age number, that, that's like a, to me, it's like a fantasy number. Because right. these things are already been set in place to carry into life. And you might not be able to answer this, and maybe this is a question for all of us, but I'm curious if this sort of significant trend line down on what the county support has been in 2000. Does anybody have any feel, maybe you can fill us in on why, why that's been like that, or how we can uh, reverse that? <laughs> um, well, my I was not here in 2000. Um, it's always been the 37,000, 38,000 since I've been in community services. But my guess would be that um, back in the 2000s, there were a lot of different funding streams coming into um, the community services, human services at that time. And as funding sources became more and more stretched and limited, they probably have just gone down with all of the other funding that it's just a trend that all of our funding sources there lower and lower. I can answer part of that yeah. because I, I remember every year, especially when we had a board of 23 people, 
it was the board members were basically there to put out everything. They did that, that seems to be the this is what I mean between the and the outside. We'll say, I mean, just from a program perspective, when I came in in 2000, which you'll see the amount of came from the we were just programming. You know, there was very little spent time on fundraising, and it's been interesting to have a 35 hour position on fundraising, grant writing. I mean, it's just a significant amount of time and energy put into trying to sustain our fundage so we can keep doing what we do. But I, that's why we're here. We just want to keep at least what we have so it doesn't take more out of serving our kids and being able to. And well, is there anything in the ARPA funds that would be available for the station? No. Anybody know? Did you have any comments on that? that? When we discuss it at the county board, that may be one option that we could use in the ARPA fund. I would sure think that this would maybe be something in the ARPA fund that could help this program. Now, that would only be a temporary. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, that's that's we've got a lot of things. I, I hope we include that. That would be important. Maybe, uh, Amy, your resolution. Yeah, is you're, a part of that. Are you ready for that? I just have a, a motion for this committee that would go to the full board. Uh, motion to maintain municipal county funding support for the speech of municipal county. I don't know if there's any exists, but I just want to send a message to the full board that this committee for funding kinship work increasing. Uh, but at agree. least maintaining. I would really like to see that in, in part of your motion or to increase. You, you had that in there, didn't you? Yeah, it, okay. I can put my hand up to four. Motion to maintain or increase full county's funding support for kinship of Second. Call for a second and second. Adam Cook, you got you got the wording and the drop first off. Any more discussion? Yeah, I, John, I've got a comment. Um, since I'm one of the old people in the, in the room, um, I've been associated with kinship since it was founded. Uh, Mr. Camrude and Pete Ray, um, school psychologist from Unity, uh, were the people that found, uh, founded that kinship program for the county. And at that time, um, in 1980, I was still teaching at Unity and became part of that program with Pete um, and just kind of stood in the background and, and became part of that school program with them. Um, when I became an administrator at Unity in 83, then we started pushing very hard um, to get uh, kids at the high school to match up with the elementary. And it was interesting because we had our own in-school program um, and it was one of those unsounded things that we just did. And then finally, back in 1998, uh, we finally pushed it to get all eight schools in the county to have high school and middle school mentors for kids. Um, I've been fortunate enough, fortunate enough to work with all of these ladies for a very long time, and I have the utmost respect for them because the program that's in the county here um, is absolutely wonderful. I can't say enough about it. Um, you know, whether it's for fundraising or for some of the projects that we do, um, it's something that needs to be done here at the county as far as mentors and mentees. And if you're interested in doing that, uh, the oldest one that I have now is 23. And I'll guarantee you that that mentorship doesn't stop. He is now a corporal in the Marine Corps stationed over in Hawaii. He calls me every week, uh, just letting me know that it's 85 and sunny. <laughs> heard uh but anyway uh yeah exactly sure uh but he uh it's one of these things that they stay with you no matter where they go what they do they want to stay in contact and it's not because of me it's because of a relationship with a program that has done some very positive things for the for not only the kid but also the guardian or the parents and uh, you know Diane, you're, you know, you're, you're going to be knighted, sainted, and everything else that goes with it. Um, I know, and I, and so am I. I've had enough of those kids, and, and I still have some. I have an 18-year-old. <laughs> well, is there a chance that you would, you know, 
I think the board needs to know the foundation of kinship rather than what we do with on top of the table. Right, and I time. and I think they did a is good there, job with that. Is there a possibility as you know, knowing the foundation that you'd be able to say something at our county board meeting? When, next when is that next? It's next Tuesday. The other option too is if there's not enough time on the agenda, you can come and do public comment. What you just sure. said at public comment, you have three minutes would be great. I can do that in 30 that, seconds. That would, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> take, take, your, we'll take the full three minutes. Yeah, no, we don't need you to be short in the three minutes. We just, when we, if we have an agenda, you can't make it. Well, it would just be a great addition. And I think that would maybe hit some people in the heart, Bill. And that's what we're lacking. If, if you could just tell the foundation and a couple of these examples. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's. Even do it on WebEx. 17th, I believe, is our county board meeting. Yeah. Is that our county board meeting the 17th? A week from this coming Tuesday. The 21st. 21st. 20, 20, 20. That's the first time. Uh, that's the uh, Polk County Sportsmanship <laughs> Banquet that I'm in. Huh. So you're you're on. You. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm already booked for How that. How about if you send an email? Send an email I to can the do. clerk. What you just said, and sure. ask it to be sent out to all supervisors. Sure. Send it to public dot comment at <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, right from the brow time, I can go and make my comments. Just like he is from Venice. <laughs> but I, I, it's a program that I, uh, I wholeheartedly support. I can't say enough about the program uh, because you're just not going to find one. Uh, that matches up, you know, big brother, little sister, that type of thing uh, is great. And it, it just mirrors all of that. I know your wording would be just that. But... So uh, thanks for, for listening. Uh, I, I think the world of you ladies just do an utmost wonderful job. You do a stunning amount of work with very little money. Yeah. So thank you for working so hard and keeping it tight. This is another sidelight to this. I was at the Oswald School Board meeting, right? And the work and seeing these things, the needs of a student and that, and it's still astonishing to me, Bill, that uh, the school district, they're, they're open to everybody and, and the buildings are open and the facilities are open and the school district receives no funds school kids and something in our system. It's just a side by that I think the tragedy there. Okay, moving on, Tanya, do you? Uh... Yeah, we'll go um, into something more refreshing. I don't know. <laughs> COVID update. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming and presenting. I don't have as much good news. Um, we have some not great news. Um, so, so far, we closed out the month of August with 300 new cases of positive COVID, positive COVID cases. Um, so far in September, from when to today, we are at 120 positive cases, um, which is not an accurate number. Weds was down over the weekend, so we had no reporting metrics to go off of. So these numbers are probably much lower than they should be. On Friday, we had 50 cases come in, and we were averaging about 20 before that. Um, our percent positivity has increased from 11.3% to 13.8%, which is um, about 5% higher than the state, which is at 8.8% positivity. Um, good news for vaccinations, in one month we increased 2% from 45 to 47% of everybody who's completed the vaccine series. The state is at 52%, and for adults over 18 who have completed um, our county is sitting at 56%. Um, our total vaccines or that include our mobile clinics that started in May until now, um, we have given out 1,300 vaccines. Um, we have now established our mobile vaccine clinic in our parking lot in that direction. <laughs> um, we offer vaccines on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Tuesday and Thursday, they're 9 a.m. to 
4 p.m. and on Wednesday they're 9 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Um, so far, we also have increased our testing to five days per week. Same schedule, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Wednesdays until 6.30. Um, so far from May until August for testing, we did 549 tests. 68 of those were positive. So far in the month of September, so literally from the first to yesterday, we have done 222 tests. Um, out of those, 37 were positive. Um, which leads us to, we did 74 tests on Monday. So those aren't included in that percent positivity, but we have about a 25% positivity rate with our testing that we do on site here. So that's not great either. <laughs> um, and with that, just more vaccines, we need to push more vaccine vaccination. We did have um, that $100 gift, gift card that the governor issued that has been extended to the 19th of September. So if you know people who haven't had their first dose guest yet, just send them our way. We can do them here and then they can be eligible for that vaccination gift card. And then also our inmates were eligible to get the $100 um, card from the state and we were able to vaccinate some of our inmates as well. Um, of the ones that are positive, do, do we are we able to track how many have already had the vaccine? Um, I'm working on trying to pull some of those numbers out of WEDS, and like I said, we're still behind by like two. There days. is some. There is some. We um, do track when we do our disease investigation. There is a question: Have you been vaccinated? Say yes or no, and so then we can buy their immunization records to that disease investigation. It's just a matter of me pulling out that data, but we have seen breakthrough cases. Um, the symptoms have been milder. People who had been vaccinated versus some of the severe COVID cases or COVID symptoms. How many deaths do you have we in the county since for since this whole thing started that are definitely Sorry. attributed to COVID? I have the last time I saw. What we're seeing because it's going we don't have two weeks. We're seeing school stuff yet? Yes. Okay. What of these numbers? Um, I didn't get that down for positivity, but our schools have staff and kids who are out positive. Um, we've seen a large increase at the end of last week after the Labor Day weekend. Um, right now, all of our schools are trending upward with cases. So each school has their own. Um, back to school plan. So each school has a different return plan. So some of them may include full tracking, some of them may not. So it depends on the school and what they decided. So the contact tracing within a school, so if somebody comes down with COVID, the kid next to them might not be, depending on the school district, may or may not know, be notified. You repeat again, I didn't realize that there was a $100 gift certificate in the so the governor promotions again. Yeah, the governor um, issued a hundred dollar. It's a Visa gift card or a US bank card. So if you get your first dose, and from now into September nineteenth, you are eligible for that gift card. So and you got it back to August twentieth. Yeah, so it's August twentieth to September 9th. So you fill out a form yeah, online to get that um, rewards card in the mail. You have to have a mailbox address associated with you. That's really publicized. I don't know. A lot you know, we're pushing it out to our. Um, yes. You guys like putting on any kind of newspaper article in the local papers? The state has, since this is a state program, not a county program, and the state has been doing the majority of the advertising. We've done, um, shared it with all of our partners in social media. I sent it to all the county employees. As while trying to get word of mouth out. We don't get the Wisconsin news here. I know that was available in Minnesota. I guess that's not on the sports page. I didn't know that either. It's not on the sports page, so I didn't have much to see it. I think, I wonder if we shouldn't be doing a little bit more advertising. Has any of this increase in cases in the county has been spurred in the industry? 
I believe so. So for the month of August, I didn't share this data. I apologize. We did 475 vaccines through our mobile in in clinic efforts, and out of that, 107 were kiddos. And we started doing Pfizer at the beginning of August. So I think that's been very successful. And for September so far, for the first couple of, um, days, we've done 72 vaccines, and 10 of them are kiddos. Kiddos is above the age of 12. Yeah. Far as our vaccine goes, seventy-two total, and ten of them are kids. Remember a while ago we did that ran an ad or something when COVID first hit, and the board said, "Let's do some publicity around education." We ran something that said, "I don't remember what it said, but it was early on in the COVID pandemic, and we were trying to get edu people educated to be careful." Can we do something like that again? Because these numbers are pretty striking. Yeah. We, I think it's pretty prevalently felt, and I'm, you can correct me, but that COVID passed and you know, blah, 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 blah. But clearly the numbers don't support that. And we, we have, I mean, we're really stressing our staff here and our medical systems. And we have a friend who's a nurse in, in, uh, Abbott in the Twin Cities, and he's treating people in the hallway, catching people in recliners because the COVID piece is a layer on top of their already stress. So it's kind of like pretty striking. So I would wish that we could do some kind of repeat of that piece that you did. That that yeah. I think to their credit, we've been getting the word out quite a bit. That, you know, the question is how much is too much. I don't know. You did a newspaper. These were the newspapers. The reality is, the dark side of this is we got 50% back pay, give or take. It's the same in this building, we think. It's the same in GAM employees. It's the same in the town. So we're trying to figure out what is it that will encourage more people to get vaccinated. $100 has been out there and advertised. It's not seeming to have a lot of impact. Not. So, I mean, I think we're getting some, getting but, but that's some. Not what drives them exactly. to get back. It's more of um, family members encouraging it, or a lot of it has been done with sports in school to help with that isolation period. But we're to the point that we really need to figure out how to work with our community to get them to understand the value of getting vaccinated um, and maybe have more of a positive uh, onto why I get vaccinated versus so much of the negative just to see get that information out. But right now it's going to be harder to get those anti vaccines. I think that, that's the key right there the positive versus the negative. And you know, we have to respect these people too. I think calling people who don't get vaccinated anti vaxxers is the neg is the negative. So, and I think people, the more they hear that, that they're now labeled anti vaxxers the more they dig in and say, I'm not having that. And, and I really do. I think people don't like being called that. And, and I think most people are for vaccines. I mean, most people are, you know, everybody's had the smallpox vaccine, the polio vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. I, I think most people are for vaccines. I think it's different with this vaccine than it is. Has been in the past. It is because some of it is still emergency use, except for Pfizer for 18 and older. Yeah. But also, I think there needs just to be also more messaging about why masking is important. Like, if you choose not to get vaccinated for your personal reasons, you also have to realize how it impacts others around you, as you could be the carrier and take it to your 90 year old grandmother who could fall very ill with COVID. So, I think we just need to talk about the more layered approach to. Um, stopping the spread, which is masking, hand sanitizing, social distancing, and it's just really for people to make those good choices for their health. I just have a comment, if I could. Sure. Um, you know, here in Europe, as we've been to Rome and uh, Florence and now Venice, it's just a matter of course. Everyone is very, very comfortable and accepting of masking and we show our uh, vaccination card wherever we go and people 
are just, you know, they're just living life and they're like, okay, right. We mask when we're inside and we, we have our vaccination card and it is just, a, I mean, this is not a U.S. thing. And this is the problem that some of the media portrays is like, this is a, some kind of oppressive lack of freedom or something, but this is a worldwide pandemic and if people here are, they accept they, they want to live life and they just keep on, you know? And so we just, um, I think it's too politicized and really we just, it masking and vaccinations and hand washing and you just, you just use common sense. I, I mean, we've had pandemics in history before and, and I don't know, I just think we, we need to send that message. It's not a big deal. You know, it's not, it's I, not a political issue. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to offer. Thanks, uh, Rita. It, it's interesting to know what's happening around the world. Cause as far as I know, the world situation, uh, there's some countries that have had hardly no vaccine. India, Haiti. If anything, they have, they have them available. They don't that's a problem. That's the problem. They do not have available vaccine. The thing to stress is we are so privileged, so privileged in our country. We have free vaccine. We have, a, you can get it. You can get a bonus to get it. You can get a hundred dollar gift card to get it. We are so privileged. These people would are very, they'll go to very long lengths to try to get it. And we have it. And we have to realize we are so privileged. And this is what I don't think the general public sometimes realizes. Hey. I was just going to say, you know, I agree with Sharon. People become dug in. And people right now uh, here is not everybody, of course, but there, there seems to be an attitude of you can't tell me what to do. And you tell me not to do it. I'm going to do it twice and I'm going to take pictures. You know, and then I'm going to send them to your mom. You know, it's yeah. people, become, people become dug dug in, and I, you know, and I too, I, you know, I think it's the the that it's become politicized is kind of what led maybe to some of that. Well, I think like for somebody older like me, if it wouldn't be when I started one room grade school, the county nurse came down, and you got your smallpox and everything else. And or you didn't go to school, but now it's a matter of freedom. I gotta tell you what I just hit me in the heart last night. I sat down to the school board and there was a lady, she had all her credentials. She's in the medical field at the University of Minnesota. I don't know what through the university, but the medical field in Minnesota. Research medical. And she was so adamant she just attacked the School board don't ever want to see one dollar going to. Uh, she had statutes there. I don't want to see one dollar going to uh, buy masks, buy uh, stuff, and, and that that's just general practice. She was adamant that one dollar can go toward buying any medical. She said mm -hmm. she had four kids. And she said I will never have them back. So there's where you hear the other side. We live in a free country, and we've got to respect all that too. I think anybody that heard her last night. Well, yeah, you got to respect it, and then they have the choice to get sick and die. That's they have the choice. It's a free country. But if, yeah, if they want to choose to get sick and die, but if they want to choose to make other people sick, and the superintendent says no, uh, every. All the maps and everything we've got have came for the, from the federal government. She said, well, you better not have one hour of any of your staff. What is she going to do about it? You know what I mean? Does she pay taxes there? Well, yeah. Does she homeschool her kids? Yeah, that's a good point, too. That's when, that's when I asked. Funding for homeschooling. 
Well, the state has vaccination requirements for a number of vaccines, I assume that. Well, if it's not, not on that not. list, so, and that's something that if the state would like to go through their statute and mandate COVID vaccine, they can. But until they do that, there's no requirement to get the COVID vaccine. Would that, would that be the legislature would have to do that? I know in every Supreme, in every state Supreme Court, our national Supreme Court, our national, our freedom is the case. You just talk a little bit ago about the reaching out to the responses of the what do you guys think that you're doing? I'm working with our marketing person. We're working on a video to discuss some people's um, personal views about the vaccine. I'm trying to get some people who have changed their mind about getting vaccinated versus not being vaccinated. And then just what our testing process is. What does it look like to get vaccinated here? Um, and then also just working with our schools and Community partners on correct and accurate messaging about COVID in our community. So, getting together some statistics, um, just posting more information so people can visually and also read. So, like just having like a bar graph to show our hospitalizations are going up, or just, you know, these are our numbers. Like we have the dashboard, but sometimes that has so much information you don't know what to look at. We're just looking at taking some of that out to emphasize this is what we're seeing. And also, just up, the state is also updating some of their data. And we're going to share that um, right now. They have breakthrough cases all lumped together from kids to the elderly and hospitalizations. They're actually going to break it out in age range group now to see breakthrough cases for people who are vaccinated and then cases who are unvaccinated. So you can have a clear from 30 to 50. You can see the difference with people getting sick. Yes, would you say that our state and federal? Uh, dollars that, that we have enough defense for the people on the other side out there that are challenging uh, our workers here for tax dollars supporting a cause they don't believe in? Sure, I understand your question. Well, you, we're, we're getting a state and federal dollars, you know, into our health care system here. And so do we have enough defense? We can tell these people that that say, I don't want any tax dollars going toward this program that I don't support. You should run for office. Yeah, I don't think there's, <laughs> they can say that, but I think, you know, the money has come into our coffers already to support this and it will probably continue to come. I think it's a universal concept that for most people that, hey, we want to stop this when, when we can. Uh, the, the bigger challenge is, is, is how are how are we going to do it? And what's people have different reasons. I mean, people are just saying, I don't want to be told what to do. Some people like the idea of vaccines. Some people have a different theory on the course of, of uh, viruses. And, and people have different reasons. And so I think our message That's is our challenge. Yeah. Okay. So it's something I wanted to bring up today, and I hope this is appropriate. If it's not, let's. So, as a county supervisor, I'm getting a lot of emails that are all the same email, but they're signed by a different person uh, dealing with, you know, vaccines and mandates and COVID related issues. And um, the nice folks who are sending these emails, um, you know, I applaud their citizenship. Uh, I appreciate that they reach out. But I don't think that they understand that. What they're asking us to do are things that we have no control over. Exactly. They're not any county issues that come to the county board to make decisions on or come to the county board to vote on because, you know, they're telling us they're going to watch how we vote. Mm -hmm. But this isn't anything that we have any authority or control over or that we would ever vote on. So I guess I just kind of wanted to put that out there publicly, you know, that, um, uh, you know, like I said, I appreciate their citizenship, but maybe uh, it's, uh, you know, and, and they're knowing their opinions, but it's 
it's maybe better directed to people who can actually do something to help and because it's it's not a county issue that um, we we have any authority constitutionally or legally to take any actions on so i just want to get that out there. that's a lot of different emails yeah, we get a lot of them like that. Yeah, it's always been the case. Yeah, but I've noticed we're getting the same one with different names on it. So yeah. I'm thinking it's organized somehow. So. Yeah. You know, in the past decades, you know, the county health officer had the power to declare a pandemic emergency to make people uh, quarantine. And all. Do, you, do you still, as a county health officer, have any powers uh, mandate anything? I, I do, um, but it was also up to our legal system to support some of those decisions. And so if all of the players are on the same direction, it's hard to issue something and we all can support that one issue. That's a great question, Dr. Loggett, because uh, I remember when I was in school, if, if somebody had the measles, well, then uh, there were we just shut down the school, you know, if we had been in contact with them. And that seems to be the same thing right today, isn't it? Even in sports or meetings or whatever. Well, like in your office right now, it's your bell that said there were a couple of people who were under the quarantine because. Issue a quarantine notification, but, um, and we encourage people to quarantine for their health and safety and for others. Um, but if they're not a confirmed positive, there is nothing really, we can't monitor everybody on quarantine. We have no quarantine guard as it says in the statute to make sure people are staying home. So how do you really regulate that? Um, for isolation letters that we send out, um, we have the support of the sheriff and the district attorney to issue those letters in person if we can't get a hold of them. I mean, know that they're leaving their isolation so just to get that communication out but again it's we need people to be educated to understand the severity of spreading COVID in our community so in answer to Dr. Fox's question you do have that authority I do but again it there's not just my authority we also have to look to our legal system to help support that any other questions and we'll be moving on well I know that I know that the um, Biden administration uh, that if you're if the hospital are getting um, Medicare dollars or Medicaid dollars, that they have to have their staff vaccinated. Well, actually, is mandating uh, that all our employees get vaccinated. Yeah, we we are monitoring that because as you've heard, we expect a lot of twists and turns of this whole thing. 75 days from that announcement, 20 days ago, that is. Uh, Wisconsin Counties Association and their attorneys are looking at this um, to identify, and we're trying to identify what in Wisconsin pertains to the county building, what pertains to the health department, what pertains to our nursing homes. And so we're preparing to, uh, you know, for everything right now. One, if we have to get everyone vaccinated or tested, we got to start setting up plans for that. Or is it something that may or may not happen? So, I mean, it's it's still a little bit up in the air right now. There'll be court cases. In the oh, yeah, they're lined up. Last question. I, I'm always getting these two questions. Do I just send these to certain parents? Or can I just send them? How am I going to know if my kid's exposed or when does the classroom get set? Um, I would definitely refer them back to the school because again, each school has their own plan that varies from school to school. So the school would be the most expert on that information. But if they do have follow-up questions related to COVID and specifically to COVID and what does that do to my child and things like that, you can definitely go back to the health department. But how schools are handling um, COVID notification and contact tracing and quarantine, it really is each school unique. Do you provide a recommended sort of framework for that? Uh, we did share CDC with um, we did share with our schools the CDC and the DHS guidelines and recommendations um, with all of our schools, and they have 
made the choice to um, follow them or make modifications. We did share that information with them. All eight schools in our county have a full time uh, staff? No. 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 Some do and some don't. Yes. So they have the other ones have consulting nurses. No, they go through the county, go through the county health department. I have a final comment on uh, about COVID. Um, I was on a conference call with Mayo on Thursday morning for an hour, and we were uh, at the Wisconsin Health Department on Friday morning. So I was on the gate in the morning. And I think it was the Mayo people that kind of said, well, you know, even though you're vaccinated, you probably should wear a mask indoor because you can still get exposed to people who are not vaccinated who may not be maybe asymptomatic and they can give you the virus. That's how we're getting these breakthrough cases. So I think please consider if you're going into like indoor stores or marketplace or Menards or Walmart. Maybe you should wear a mask. I do. Any further questions then we'll be moving on. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Anya. I think Andy is up. He's right behind you. <laughs> Morning. Well, you were sitting back there in the sunlight. We didn't even see you. It's my friend. Excuse me for that. No worries. Well, good morning, everyone. I really don't have much of an update um, this month. Business as usual down in the Veteran Service Office. We're busy. We continue to be busy. Um, haven't really seen any decrease in appointments or anything like that. Minneapolis VA healthcare system is, for the most part, operating at the same capacity before COVID-19. Um, They've switched a lot to as far as like telehealth and video appointments and things like that and do that when it's appropriate for the appointment and if the veteran has so. Um, so a lot of veterans like that some prefer in person, so it's kind of an equal balance there. So is there anything in the ARPA funds that can help your vet our veterans department? Not that I'm aware of. Been contacted from the Polk County Museum. They're going to have a event in November. Yep. And I've actually, I sent that list of the World War II veterans this right. morning before I came up. Okay, good. Yep. Any questions for Dr. Andrew? No, it's just Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tend to anybody that uh, helps somebody else or fixes something, <laughs> give them credit for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hope you can make the event. Here you go. Hope you can make the event out if you see our. Well, I haven't been invited at this point. Wow. I'm inviting you. I'll okay. make sure it's formally done. Unless I miss it in the email, but I got the request for the list of veterans. Okay. But I'll go back and look at the email. Maybe I can go over it. I will make sure. Uh, yeah, I think you two better get together because he certainly Thank needs you. to be part of that. So, Vincent, number 11, is that up to you? Yeah, let me. Um, I think some of you may have attended the general government committee, and I gave kind of the overall um, position of where we are in terms of um, additional funding requests. We're still working on finalizing the uh, levy amount, basically, the directives to the directors in each division was to come in equal to what they were last year. The rationale being uh, we all put a little money back into our general fund last year, so we just increase when we're in this uh, economically uncertain time. So I put a little pressure on that way. They all did a terrific job. What they did do, though, as usual, and at this time with uh, good thought and, and preparation, it came through with some additional funding requests. And I would just say from the uh, uh, Health and Human Services or the Community Services Division, both of the additional requests dealt with some uh, remodeling to enhance customer service so people can come in and do something. And, and I've already approved those as of the general government. 
more details, more uh, of the total overall budget will be coming next month. You and I know all of us our tax levy is going to be up some sales tax is beyond expectations and we have some ARPA funds to help out general public out there thinking that they're to their equalized value and everything that is tax tax base might be down fifty that's the anticipation out there um, well, the levy will be what the levy is, and, and I think with when you see some of the additional requests throughout the county, there are some areas, some things that we do need to address. And I, 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 in fact, I told the general government there are many things that, quite frankly, have been put off year after year after year after year, and we said now's probably the time we have to, to act on them. So we're going to do that um, or recommend that. I think. Uh, as far as what the citizens are going to see is they're going to see fiscal conservative approach uh, in terms of added programs and so on. So I think what we're trying to keep it flat. Do you think it'll be the same dollar number on our tax or increase, decrease what you're saying? Well, that will depend. Uh, I mean, Dr. Roberts is, uh, he's got those answers. But. Still working on, on what the levy is going to be. We will get an increase due to a net new construction. We will get an increase uh, somewhat due to sales tax. So that is, you know, we've been underestimating that the last few years. Right. This year, we really popped on it again. No guarantee on that. Um, so we try to maintain it a consistent growth area. As far as the ARPA funds, let just let me say that we're going to be discussing that uh, coming up at the board meeting. Uh, and and the real question is is uh, how do we want to use those? This is a unique windfall at one time where we can do something that can help the county long term. Uh, and but it cannot be used. I think just to offset tax. What's your outlook, Doctor Roberts, on? Uh the per capita or uh, to the our, our individual taxes in increase or decrease? Well, that's a little hard to predict at this point. We're still working on that. But if the board recalls last year, the board chose not to take the full levy, which resulted in a slight tax break. We left about 339,000 untaken. Uh, this year's levy calculation has our levy up $264,000 which is a little more of an increase than we've seen in past years, but that's because equalized value is up so much. But Vince touched on an important point. Since the ARPA money was recovered as lost revenue by the board, the board has a wide uh, scope of things they can use that money on, but it is specifically excluded from using it to provide a tax break or a tax rebate. So, I guess in saying that the levy dollars have to be taken um, to pay for things before the ARPA can pay for things, if that makes sense. That's the only exclusion that really exists when you claim it as lost revenue. Well, I, I think, I don't know if I'm getting the picture across, but uh, as a taxpayer, they're always, they're always aware, of, well, maybe you refinance to save some dollars and hopefully that's going to decrease my taxes a little bit. Uh, and they're always looking for some key things. And we all know that the ARP is going to have no effect on our taxes, except maybe it paid for something that would have been a part of our, our budget item. Right, right. You know, the ARPA, that's for the board to choose, but you know, if if you got a project on, you know, in your sites that you've been wanting to get funded and it's not established yet in the budget, then you could use the ARPA and in future years, you wouldn't be using budget dollars to pay for that since you use the ARPA. That's that's one way of looking at giving back to the taxpayers as far as the tax rate goes. 
So I have a question on the Christian straight up budget. How do we fold in this um, kinship money? I mean, it's not in the budget now, right? Or is it? It, it is. It, it resides in the budget and community services. Okay. Um, but that's what the board will have to work out is where it's going to reside and and how we're going to budget for it. Okay, so it's it's in there. It's just a matter of sort of where it goes in the details of what that looks like. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, Dad, want to congratulate you on that you got another job on weekends now. I think you're going to be. <laughs> and your daughter got part of the royalty in Osceola. You're going to spend some weekends pulling the boat yeah. around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I went. I went to a meeting last night. Apparently, I have no weekends until 2022 fall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm glad it's had a, 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 all those fishing and everything else you've got on the calendar of weekends is now delegated to the youth and. <laughs> Uh, and it's not only weekend. <laughs> one time you got three parades in three days. <laughs> I, I know. This weekend's an example. I had to congratulate my daughter on it. It was her 40th anniversary of being Miss Osceola in 1981. And it's it's a great, great experience for your family. Something that you all live with. What's your name, Elaine Roberts? That's right. Uh -huh. Yes, sir. You got anything else? Hearing none. Moving on to number 12, a presentation from UW Extension regarding current services. Is that all yours, Tanya, or where are we at? Oh, it's the rest of us. Actually, oh, Chris, we well, good morning, and I think it's still morning. You guys meet a long time. I was wondering if we were really having that interesting that you're just trying to stay for our discussion. Well, you know, it's all I know. It's both and. Thank it's both you. And. So thanks for having us. Um, my name is Kristen Bruder. I'm the extension director um, for Pope Pierce and St. Croix counties. Um, so I oversee programming in the, those three counties. Um, I brought some colleagues here for some program areas. Um, basically what we'd like to do today is to give you um, kind of an overview or a snapshot of how we in interface with community services and the rest of the broader community on health outcomes. Um, and so how we work with and um, interface with those uh, nonprofits, schools, community services, and other entities. Um, I, I uh, gave you gracious enough to hand out, give you some handouts. So this one is just a broad overview of extension. So it's a very high, high level, if you will. So um, if you have any questions on that, we'd be happy to have you uh, um, ask those and we'll answer those. This is um, kind of a snapshot of what we're talking about today. Um, they're gonna drill into some of these, but this just gives you an idea of some of the things that we might be doing or we are doing right now in uh, Polk County. So I'm going to turn it over to the people doing the work um, so I'm going to start with Katie, um, our PYS coordinator, and then I'll kind of start to cycle through. Good morning. I'm Katie Martineau. I coordinate the PYS program for school in Area 5. I guess I can hear you real good. Ah, would you please? <laughs> I for sure can. Well, I'll start over. I didn't hear that at all. Yep, no problem. My name is Katie Bartko. I'm the food wise coordinator for Pierce, Polk, and St. Croix County. So the, the three counties that are in area five of the extension. Um, and that I also have a nutrition educator that works with me in the food wise program. Her name is Kate. And between the two of us, we cover those three counties, um, providing um, nutrition education and resource management education to food share eligible audiences. So I see you found our brochure. Um, we're, we're kind of the uh, duck of extension. Our, our funding is different. We're funded from the federal level um, through a grant program. So um, there's no uh, county funds directly supporting our program um, as far as staff time or anything like that. Um, and we serve, uh, we provide those services, um, as I mentioned, to food share eligible audiences. 
So that means I can't just like put out a notice to you know come to our class. I have to find a partner that um, is serving uh, potentially eligible audiences where at least 50% of those uh, people that would be there would be eligible for food share. They don't have to be participating, but they have to be eligible. Um, so that means uh, with our school districts, um, they need to have 50% free or reduced lunch participation. So we have four of those districts in Polk County, and we do um, go into classrooms in those four school districts. Um, they are Clayton, Lost, Frederick, and Unity. So we do elementary schools in all four of those districts, and then high school in Unity, kind of uh, branching out there and trying some new things with them. Um, other, other partners that we have in the county are uh, like Head Start, uh, Workforce Resource, um, and we've done some partnering with the tribe, I think. Uh, what you might be most interested in is our partnership with uh, the county program. Uh, so we work to support nutrition education uh, in the WIC population, uh, supplemental education there, and then also um, community services. We yeah. will gone into their mental health support group and uh, some fun nutrition classes as well. Um, and then I also work with Hope United on um, nutrition specific work groups and efforts that are happening there. So that's just kind of a, a quick summary of what Twice does. And I'll turn it over to Twice. She's our your title on. <laughs> I'll let you say it. <laughs> <laughs> what that means is that I work with grow on uh, how they want to address our institutions. Just can't quite hear you. I work. Um, you can come right up to the chair here. <laughs> there, there. Now you're burning. So, <laughs> I, I'm a community development educator for the area of organization. So, just some high points of things that I've done in the past that are also applicable to your community. Um, for example, uh, at current, I'm working on a statewide program for nonprofits. So this group was very near and dear to me, kinship. It's a leadership and organizational development sort of uh, program we are launching in September. What we do is we help nonprofits learn how to better understand their leadership style as a way to then relate it back to their overall organizational culture, how to grow. Typically during times of crisis, we give them tools to study by which to use and so forth. So that's one way that I can uh, help and assist here. Another way is I've also done uh, a, a project with the New Richmond area. This is actually a regional project. The Veterans Forum Corps uh, have attempted to grow a facility by which they would provide medical services, counseling services, psychiatric services to folks such as veterans all through the region um, as a prior service for this facility as well. So that's yet to be but um, did some project management there and some strategic planning. Um, additionally, I'm also working in the Avery community at Current on what's called a design charrette. It's a group of volunteers who come in, uh, designers, builders, et cetera, extension educators, and what they do is they meet with the community and try to help create placemaking or vitality. So therefore, to help grow the community in a way that really puts people back into the Um, beyond that, I actually had 20 some years in K 12 and administration. And so, the stint in that was directed, directly related to people services and school based mental health. So, I do a lot of work with various schools, um, trying to streamline those services, network, and know that, and process lobby for more needs and so forth. Um, I guess something that I'm really passionate about. The idea of culturally relevant practices. When we talk about our students, 
and how they have much better way of anxiety and them to promote the idea of who they are, identity, belonging, and so forth. That's really relevant practices is something that I aim to uh, grow and work for schools. And what schools are you in? I'm currently, so I also serve, sorry, Hope County at the same time. So I sit on a board of schools. Primarily covered by so. so I think it's perfect. You mentioned the VFW, are, are they at trying to build a Facility in Richmond, I believe they purchased some land. Um, they were, yes, it's a roundabout way they purchased some land. Depicted, but it was with the intent to grow this regional facility. Okay. Slowly, yes, <laughs> Tanya, what really troubles me. Our county board has no concept of uh, extension at all. Remember last year, we, we cut the funding on the county level completely. Hence my vote. Did we? Did we? Did we? Did we? Cut Master Gardner. Master Gardner. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. 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 Better. Part of it. But still, my statement is that the, I believe, as a majority of county board members, we don't have very little insight on what extension does in Polk County. I mean, if we didn't have the uh, meals for the needy and the meals for the seniors and everything, there'd be a revolt in Polk County. And we take everything, most of the people take everything for granted. You people are all part of that. Anything we can do to get a better understanding and a board member, that's what we need. So if somebody could talk about extension, our county board and kinship program, I'd like to see. It's been going through committees interface with committees on what is important to you and how we interface with departments that you oversee. Committee is a good good start and then it gets to the county board and here we've got the agenda and as soon as we get done with the agenda we're just there for the business the agenda. What do we have since this year for budget? Do we have extension in our budget this year in some form or fashion? Yes. What is it at, covered? At the amount they requested. A little less than last year. Sure. What is it cover? What's that cover? You so it'll for you. Well, my I'm a state funded position, but I but I oversee the uh, staff, and then I also work on the budgets in all three counties. So I oversee the budget in all, in all three counties, so in Pope County as well. And so it will cover the uh, contract that we have that covers the, the educators that are um, that you have in your county, and it's a, a co-funded. These are co-funded positions, so. So, you know, except for Katie's position, which is completely covered by the federal um, by federal funds, so you don't even pay for Katie and the educator and their services. Um, the rest have a co-funded relationship with the state where you pay about 50% of the salary and fringe for the educator at a flat fee. So um, all educators across the state, uh, the counties pay the same. So it's about 43,000. Um, 42.5, I think, is what it was this year. So for each educator, added 1.0 FTE, you pay about 42,000. Carrie is a 0.5 FTE in Polk County because you share her with St. Croix County. So you pay approximately 21,000 for um, for Carrie's position. Don is a 1.0 in Polk County, so you pay the full amount, and you'll hear from Don in a second. Um, and then uh, you know you offer um, support services. So we have Terry Hill in our office, and then also um, supplies. Uh, so we have a we have a travel budget, a supply budget that the county also um, 
the, office, the county also uh, funds for extension. We do get other funding from our institutes. We do get other funding from the state that also comes into into play. Um, but that's that's what our budget overview. Is. What do we what do we compare to the support you're getting from other? Good question. Meaning, like the support staff. Uh, what, is, what is Saint Croix putting in? What is I mean, how well, are, we, Croix, are we underfunding our our effort or overfunding? Well, a few years ago, we had a, a pretty. So we have 42 development at a 1.0. We have 22 development at a 0.5. You did have a 1.0 a few years ago, but that position was cut to 0.5. Now you're sharing with Saint Croix. Um, human development is at a 1.0. Ag. I did put the ag staffing model. Into the budget this year, um, you have funded ag at a point two, and you moved. And then the, the the horticulture position was was if not a master gardener position. So I wanna I wanna I wanna Thank be you. real clear about yeah. that. Uh, master gardeners is 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 a is a separate association. They can be master gardeners regardless. We just offer the training for master gardeners in extension. So it's a horticulture position that was cut last year. That was a 0.25 position. It was approximately $9,000 that the county was paying. That position was cut. Um, but we are, we introduced to the environmental committee um, a few weeks ago, the ag staffing model to bring a, a bigger ag um, presence to Polk County. So we'll have two 1.0 FTE ag educators across four counties. Here, St. Croix and Barron, and then we'll have regional staff um, that will um, specialize in like water quality, um, farm management, um, you know, some of those real specific issues that are happening on this side of the state, this region. We'll have some regional specialists that are funded by the state that will be interfacing with the uh, county as well. So it's a new model that we're introducing, and we're really excited about it because we feel like we can really. Um, we can really specialize in some areas that is really needed in this side of the state and, and across the state. And so what can we bring back that horticulture that we cut at thinking it was a master gardener? Maybe, so, maybe that would be more supported at the county board level. So what we, well, in this new X, if you fund the ag staffing model, so if you fund the budget as is in the, in the that I'm introducing to the board, that in that model, um, we have, State horticulture support. Okay. So um, we will you will have access right currently. We don't you don't have access to horticulture support because you're not paying for it currently. Starting January one with the new ag staffing model, there will be state support. You won't have a local person, but you'll have state support. So we'll be able to answer people's horticulture questions. We'll be able to, you know, send information to them. We'll be able to work with. Our state um, horticulture uh, specialists to interface with our with your people in Polk County, and the master gardeners will have more support moving forward with this ag staffing model. What is a horticulture question? Where, where does it diverge from an ag question? So horticulture is you know a lot, a lot like the um, uh, like uh, working within the home gardening. Um, like our ag is pretty specialized in beef, dairy. Um, Farm management, whereas horticulture might be home uh, pesticide management for home use in gardens. Um, it, it'll be questions that if you have a diseased tree uh, or something in your yard, or if all of a sudden the tomatoes have, you know, or when light hit or some of those worms that came, <laughs> they were there for everything. Yes, horticulture, they're the ones that cover all of that. Our ag people, our ag specialists specialize more on. The bigger ag issues, not the home yeah. support, if you will. We also do uh, support. We supported a lot of the industry as uh, horticulture as well. But that's where that diversion. Would be. But I just want to give you some examples. I mean, in my lifetime, when when I started school, I got in 4-H and all the programs, my electrician project, everything. I learned everything through extension, and I started farming. Every month they had like the. the uh, uh, extension man came around, uh, Al Franco, and he sat down at the table and, and went through all the records and and uh, uh, all the and the uh, pesticides and everything. They were there for you every day. I mean, everything came from extension 
uh, added some kind of a problem, answered some kind of problem to success in your life. And now we have a county board member that says, no, we can get everything through the my co-op advisor and uh, we can get everything through the uh, through, through the uh, online. And as a result, I believe our master gardeners now gone yep. and uh and that's yeah. partly true um what we do in extension is that you know we we actually partner with a lot of co-ops but what we do is we give the non-biased information to the public so, the, so we don't have a bias my point is the rest of the board members you know they hear a statement from somebody and so we vote to cut it and yep. the, the other side of the benefit was never presented then so much Misleading stuff that really. Uh, well, if you're, if you're, we always need to know the benefit of what we can get from the pro program. I think if you're getting advice from somebody to sell something, you always need to have just in the back of your mind, just maybe a little bit of grain of salt that that advice is going to be to, you know, the benefit of what they're trying to sell. And we really don't know what the. You know, it's not, what, it's not, a, it's not going to be on bias advice. It's we don't be, know what the state and the federal and everything, what parts they, they play in the funding. Yeah. Could just add one comment to the discussion. To be fair, UW Extension has undergone a review. And part of that is because many of the concerns that were raised here in Polk County were raised those types of things. And I know I'm just stating it from your perspective, but I think as a result, they've come back with a reorganization that the Environmental Services Committee can that make more sense to us and why they're getting the funding that they do. Specific to the egg staffing model you're referring to, Liz? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah there was John, a you have a presentation that could give them. I'm going to be super brief because I think everybody wants to be doing something else. Uh, what I'm going to do is just take a second. First, Don Wortham. Uh, I think most of you have seen me before in here. We've, we've done some good work. Terry Weiss and I helped uh, this board come up with your four primary objectives about a year and a half ago. And some of these are directly related to health and human services, I think. We do a whole lot of work with uh, reducing substance abuse, uh, TJCC crime and community, uh, reducing crime and uh, recidivism. Uh, recreation and tourism, maybe a little broadband. So maybe part of the problem with extension is we do a lot. We may be a little bit invisible because we're spread in so many different projects, but we have a little bit of a framework that can help. So I like to think of it as a, as a stack. And at the bottom, extension helps people. So you got 4-H and that chair right there is the incoming 4-H educator that you're gonna help us hire because that person works with about 700 kids in the county. And John just gave a really good uh, two minute explanation of it, about how wonderful that is. Uh, our longstanding extension educator, Chuck, is in the process of retiring, I think. So it's a little bit strange. We, we want to make sure. We're on board in January. Yes. We're going to have a really capable person sitting in that chair. So we help people out. So my colleague Katie uh, here and I, we work with the community service program and Tanya's group with disabled adults to help them understand how to get their bodies moving. We need better working with people. One level up, extension folks work with systems. So sometimes these are technical systems. Like right now, I'm plugged into public health and community services division to work on a planning framework that uses this great new technology. Chad's in there somewhere, right? Office 365 has great planning tools, and extensions providing the technical assistance. You get community service division, maybe, maybe CJCC, and a little bit of general government doing planning using some of these tools. Top level is policy. I've already pointed to this board up here. We assist with policy formation. That's your job, right? Okay. We also work outside the County structure. Right now, I'm helping the city of St. Clair Falls with some of their planning. In just a couple of minutes, my colleague Carrie and I are going to go work for the Polk County Economic Development Corporation, do some strategy. 
So people, systems, and policy. That's what we do. We can seem like we're a little spread out, but uh, call us. We'll try to help you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, Don, that's the thing I'm trying to get across to the taxpayer, the, to the county board, where they're getting the bang for their buck. That's what they want to know. Don just did it perfectly in the sense that that's why it's really difficult for us to, you know, that people always say, well, we don't know what extension does. And I think that's the reason is because we could sit on any one of the oversight committees because we touch all of the oversight committees in some shape or form. And so to, to really get to, and that's why we were very thankful that Tanya allowed us the time to come in and talk with you all on how we interface with you and to give you a better understanding of what you're paying for in in Polk County. So I hope that I hope it helped a little bit. I hope it didn't confuse you anymore. But our doors are always open. So come on in, come see some of our programs, sit in on some of these strategic planning sessions, you know, come to the schools and watch the educator in action. Um, it's really good work. It's we're hands, we're feet on the ground. A lot of people say, oh, you're UW Madison. No, we live and work right here. And we work with the communities. Um, you know, across the state. So we're the extension arm, we're the, you know, Wisconsin idea, that's us. Uh, we just happen to be housed under UW Madison, which is a new relationship within the last few years. So we could go on, but did you have any questions? I want to thank you people for coming and being part of our program. And keep this committee more open. Rather than just the thousand part. I think that's the purpose of committees. Not yeah. following everything right, but it's really discussion. We'd be happy to come back anytime. So anytime you want to hear from us, just let us let Tanya know. She can Tanya will let you wind up in anything that we have. Thank you. Um, well, it looks like for next month. We'll um, have the child support chat back and forth as update. Um, I believe we'll be presenting the annual budget amendments. Um, the time COVID 19 update, obviously, a division update, um, legislative event report, the wall, which is lying on you these days for being our politician and representative for going to all those. I think our health and human services budget, aren't we? Through like child support and sports and everything. Our, our budget is one of the larger budgets of yeah. the whole entire county, but we've got, I don't know, 100 different funding streams, lobby included. So, yeah, one of the larger departments. So, providing all of those mandated services. Dad or Vince or anybody else got anything you wanted to bring to the committee? Yeah. Budget will have details, and we appreciate all your details in that. They're uh, they're important from the top to bottom. Any questions with any committee before we adjourn for the month of October? Till the month of October. Move. Adam Clark got to move and second. All in favor, say aye. Aye. aye.